<laughs> good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone here. If I didn't get to hug you yet, good morning. And good morning to everybody that tunes in online each and every week. Um, this morning, I just... I was getting ready and I was feeling such a deep sense of gratitude. This last week we started the new study group, Ecclesia, with Roy and we've got a group of people from all over the world and it's just really amazing to me the amount of people that are coming together to understand the truth of who and what God is and who Yeshua was and still is today as a teacher and I have this saying that I say to people sometimes, and it was coming through this morning, but the way I look at Yeshua is that he was the greatest example, not the greatest exception. He was not the only one that was able to tap into the divine intelligence that we know as God. We get to be that too, and that's what we are here to learn and what we're here to remember and recall. So if you'll take a deep breath with me this morning, we're going to open up with some prayer. Just getting relaxed into your body, recognizing this body, recognizing your spirit, your mind, the connectedness of all of it. Recognizing right now that we are one with this divine creator, our Father, God, the source of all love. And so I just recognize the power in that and I recognize the power in coming together to study these truths, to remember these truths, to get them deep into our bones so that we know the truth of who we be as children of the Most High. And so this morning I declare that this message be blessed, that it be anointed, that it fall on the ears and the eyes of the people that are meant to hear it and meant to receive it. I ask right now this morning, God, that each and every person that tunes into this message, wherever you are in the world, that your heart be opened up to something new, that the veil of illusion that you may be experiencing be lifted, that the truth of the divine come through Roy this morning in a way that lands so softly and so tenderly in your body that it feels like home. I say thank you this morning. Thank you for each and every person that gathers together in this living room week after week. Thank you for each and every person that tunes in online, no matter where you are in the world. Thank you for coming with your spiritual eye open. Thank you for coming with your spiritual ear tuned to the frequency of the divine so that you may hear the truth that is spoken today. I declare peace and healing and favor over each and every person that tunes in today and every day, whether you catch the live, you watch the replay. I say thank you for you. I release these words this morning and I let them go, knowing that it is already done because God has given us the power to declare that in which we desire to experience. So I release these words this morning with such deep and humble gratitude. We live in grace and we live in faith, and together we say, and so it is. Amen. Thank you, Mallory. I always try to turn the clock away from you guys because <laughs> I went to a church once and they had the, the board did it. They had the clock behind the pastor facing the auditorium. <laughs> That's not a good thing to do, so. <laughs> well, we are glad to be here again today. Sundays seem like they come like a lightning flash, and I like that because it's my favorite day to be with you guys, and Don and I enjoy your company very much, and let me move this camera a little bit so it's not in front of Mallory's face. You all right, Donna? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I know what you, look like. you know what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice, baby. Hi, George. Good to see you with us, George. Yeah, she does it to me all the time. I, I ask her why she hasn't read my books, and she said, I've heard you preach it already. So, <laughs> she, she's, she, she has, and she's heard everything that I'm ever going to teach you guys. She sticks with it pretty good. So, But I did enjoy uh, our Ecclesia group. That was a, a lot of fun, and uh, 
I was told that I went fast and I think they need to listen to John Cahill a few times and they'll think that I'm slow. <laughs> but I did. I, I was a little nervous. I was wanting to make sure to answer the questions, but uh, we had some really good questions, really good comments. So if any of you are out there that maybe are new to this and you still have a lot of questions that's not answered to you yet, and you're questioning your theology and you want to learn a more spiritual truth, then reach out to me and we'll tell you about it. So uh, we're going to start today. We're uh, in um, uh, chapter 10 of, of Romans. We're going through it pretty quick. There's still several more chapters to go through. But this is going to be a pretty amazing book when it gets done. I probably will publish it in one large one, like an 8 by 10 book. But uh, as I read through these scriptures today, <clears throat> not in the beginning... But as you get kind of through it, we're only going to go through uh, chapter 10, 1 through 3. But the main thing that stuck out to me was meditation. And I've studied a lot on meditation lately. For quite a while I have. And I think I may have taught something on meditation a while back. But I think it's so important. And your way of medita meditation can be different than my, my way of meditation. I'm not like Allison and Mallory where I can sit down and fold my legs and and <laughs> my knees won't bend. <laughs> Stephen can, can he? You, said you have a hard time with it? You're too young for that, but not everybody can fold their legs up, and I don't do this, and I don't, I would love to sit on a beach. I saw that picture of you when you were on vacation, and I, I could do that. I can kind of stand and <laughs> whatever, but it doesn't matter where you do it. I mean, I do it in my office. I do it when I study. I be still, I be quiet, I calm myself, and I'll listen for the Father. And uh, uh, you're going to hear some things today. I'm going to give you some instructions. And if you follow those instructions, I think it will help you a whole lot because meditation is important. So let's start out with reading uh, Romans 10.1. Family, this is Paul talking to, to the Romans, and it's for us too. So family, my thoughtful conversations with Father has been one that concerns Israel. My desire, my desire and purpose are that they would enter into their eternal redemption, salvation, and inheritance. I truly wish they would realize that it is already theirs. Now, he's talking to people who uh, embraced Jesus' teachings. There was no sinner's prayer back then. Do you realize that? No. They just joined the fellowship of believers. And so that's who he's talking to. When he's talking about Israel, he's talking about the Jewish system, the people that follow the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Mosaic law. Okay? So he said, I truly wish that they would realize that it's already theirs. Holy smoke, I wish somebody had told me that a long time ago. <laughs> Verse 2, I am a witness to the fact that they hold tight to their zeal for Father. And I agree with that. There's, there's people in all kinds of denominations, and they have a zeal for Father. Yeah. The problem is they have a zeal for a false perception of Father. Mm -hmm. I did, and you did too. So however, this zeal is not based, based on who Father is. They don't have full recognition, recognition and full discernment of Him. And so, and the Apostle Paul, uh, if the Apostle Paul were here today, his thoughtful conversation would be the same to us, our world, not us personally, but our world. Uh, it wouldn't be much different. And he, he would be reflecting sincerely about, uh, say, in this generation, 2023, how the world's perception is about Father. And he would be saying, I wish you knew the truth. I wish you knew that everything that you're striving for, it's yours already. And that's everything. When the Bible says we have all things that pertain to life and godliness, in life we do have divine health. In life we do have divine provision. In life we have all the love that we will ever need from our Father. And we can do all things through contact with the divine mind or through con contact with Father that strengthens us. And I like that word strengthen because if you're not plugged into your source, there's no strength whatsoever. And I used to say this a lot when... When, you, uh, when you're sitting in your living room and you just, you just, you're antsy or whatever and you think, well, I'm hungry, and you go to the refrigerator and you open it up and nothing, oh, you know, there's nothing there. And then you go to TV and you start flipping through a television and there's nothing there, nothing satisfies you. And then maybe you get a book and try to start reading and it doesn't satisfy you. Highly likely you're hungry for spiritual union, spiritual fellowship. 
And, and many times, I believe that to really be true. And as I said a few weeks ago, sometimes when you might feel like you're sick or you're down or you're depressed, it could be a burden. So don't immediately receive it for yourself. And that's what Paul wanted people to understand because uh, there's this, the collectiveness, collectiveness is longing for kinship with one another and also with Father. Even though they think they know Father, I think down inside of them there's this yearning, I want to know Father. Because all my life I heard about Father, and I had other people tell me about Father my younger years, but I didn't know Father. I, I thought Father was way out there somewhere, and I was always trying to get to Him, always trying to reach Him. Have him I remember one day I was praying, and I asked God, if you would just touch me one time, it would build my faith up. Or I could have said had an experience. So if one is not intimately aware of who and what Father is, their understanding, their discernment of the true nature of Father is present, then that's lacking because Father is present. Yes, and is. Father never is present. You ever talk to anybody that's you're having a conversation and they're not present? Oh, yeah. yeah, Donna's got a relative that... You would talk, to, and he was just busy, and I know he really didn't mean it, but you'd be talking to him, and he would just be looking all over at everybody in the room and not looking at you. And then I've had times that I'm talking to somebody in a group and trying to explain something, and all of a sudden they look over and they just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen, you know, so they're not present. They're not connected in that conversation. And so Paul realized that people needed to understand the presence of God. And for years, I prayed and looked up to Father a long ways off. And later, I discovered through many teachers and studying myself that really, I exist as the house of the Lord. Father dwells in me. Father dwells in you. Father dwells in everyone. So that yearning that they have is to connect with that dwelling connect who they're one with and the church has failed them and teaching that because the church leaders didn't know it themselves so the bible teaches us that we are the city of god as i told you last week you are zion zion is the very heights of the city and at these discoveries you know i felt like king david and last night when i was writing i immediately heard this i was glad i heard that there and i i was glad and i was said i was glad what i was glad so i typed it in my concordance you know, and I knew what it was, but it says, I, uh, it said, I was glad when they said unto me, and this is the true translation, walk as the house of the Lord. It didn't say, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because in the King James, it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord, like it going to that physical tabernacle. But David heard, because David was questioning his theology, and I, it actually said, I was glad when they said unto me, to walk as the house of the Lord. Wow. House of the Lord. Yes. Who was it that they that said it to him? I believe it was the, the, the cloud of witnesses. I believe it was the Spirit of God. Yes. I believe that the voice of God spoke to him and told him that. Wow. And that's why I say in Hebrews when it says, let us boldly enter into the throne room of God, it actually says, let us boldly enter into being the throne room of God. You know, Mallory, I've asked people this before, if, and I know your answer today, but maybe 10 years ago it might have been different. If I told you that God was in my bedroom wanting to see you, what would you do first? Blasphemy. <laughs> well, a lot of people would go get saved first. <laughs> Let me go pray. <laughs> well, he's in there. <laughs> you know, and I asked my church that years ago. We had about 50 or 60 people, and I said, would any of you just get up and go right in there? And nobody lifted their hands. And then I begin to teach them who they are, who Father is. And then the, uh, a week or two later, I asked the same question and hands went up. Because they're just not sure, you know. So it's important for us to understand this. So the understanding of Romans chapter 10, verse 1, is inviting us, uh, if you would, to embark on this journey of self-realization and meditation about Father. It encourages us to deepen our relationship with Father, to, if you would, to have a deeper understanding. And that's what we do here at Tree of Life Fellowship, Tree of Life Ministries. We are aligning ourselves with this purpose and, and this eternal kinship that we have with Father. If you haven't listened to me before, before and this is your first time, 
uh, the word redeemed actually means kinship. We never needed to be redeemed because Father never lost us. Now, our awareness needed to be redeemed, and it has been redeemed. But, 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 there, but we, are, we have an eternal kinship that is so intimate. You know, I'm not real close to a lot of my family members. They are kin, but I'm not that close to them that, you know, I don't check in on them. I haven't seen them, some of them in years, and, you know, I don't get involved in their situation. But the kinship we have with Father is we are one. And Father knows all your thoughts, all your concerns, all your worries, all your fears. Father's source knows everything about you, and Father's always seeking to draw you closer and closer if you went into his arms, into this place of comfort where all that could be freed from you. So we want this deeper purpose. And, and metaphysically, spiritually, if you like that better, the spiritual lens here, the verse uh, serves as a reminder to us to explore again, beyond the surface level of the Bible. And I wrote to, uh, or I said it to our Ecclesia group the, the other day, right in the beginning, there's one place that we're gonna, you're going to have to get past if you're going to hear what I'm going to say to you, is quit saying, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this? You know, ask the questions, but you can't just keep going to the Bible and say, what about this verse, what about this verse? You've got to back up. And the first thing you've got to see that the Bible, again, was translated many, many times. Don't know how many times before they put it into Latin. Supposedly they had the original text, I don't know. But Latin, German, then English, and then many, many versions of English. And so you can't just sit there and say, the Bible says this. Well, yeah, the written word says this. And Ali was asking me about the Logos. The Logos is the actual meaning of the word. It's the Logos. And so when you study the Logos and you look below the surface, then you can see, like I showed you earlier, instead of saying, let us go into the house, it says, let us walk in, walk as the house. Let us, let us dwell in the house. Let us be the house. And so as you begin to study more and more and more, you begin to wake up to those things. You, need, you have understanding. I believe Father is preparing a whole lot of comforter messengers today. Because I can't reach your world, you're going to have to reach your world. Unless you bring it to me, and I don't have a whole lot of room in here for a world. <laughs> but we do out here. <laughs> so we, 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 uh, we need to uh, practice something, and that is em embodying the very presence of Father. Practicing the presence of God as Brother Lawrence. Remember, you ever heard of Brother Lawrence? He was a Catholic monk, or whatever they called him. But he, he washed dishes, and he, people would come and sit at his feet while he washed dishes and listen to him talk. And there was a book written about him about calling, practicing the presence of God. I used to have it, but it was really good. So what do we want to do? This calls us to get on board. I use that for a reason. You'll hear why in a little bit. To get on, war, get on board with what? Get on board with this transformative journey of self-discovery of our heart awareness. And, and meditate and, and think about what's in our thoughts, what, how, how our thoughts dominate us day after day after day. Because our thoughts can lead us astray. Yes. As I've said before, your feelings, uncontrolled by the Spirit, will lie to you. All of them will lie to you. And so we want to get to this place where we can realize our internal inheritance and experience this, this connection with our Father leading us to this fulfillment and this spiritual growth of our heart awareness. And I like heart awareness. Kay used it. I've, I've, I've used it some, but Kay began to use it a lot because the truth is when you look up the word spirit many times in Scripture, it's actually talking about your awareness. When I say I love you with all, with all my heart, I'm saying I love you with all my awareness. I'm, I'm letting you know that I am aware of you. I like what the... The movie, The Avatar, I like what they said, I see you. So many people don't see us the way they need to see us. Husbands and wives, sometimes they don't see each other. And that's why there are so many mistakes and so many errors that end up in fights and battles. But not just husband and wife, but all relationships. And so we get to this place where there's an inner fulfillment and this spiritual growth begins to take place. And that's where we are at Tree of Life. And that's where many people that are following us and following Kay... And I sh there has to be more ministers teaching this way. I just can't help to think that there are. Yeah. 
And so when you get on board, uh, what you get on board with is vital to your well, well-being. And too many people are getting on board with the wrong things, things that just look good, things that appeal to their senses and to their desires. And remember I talked about if your senses, your will, your de desire is not under the control of the spirit, then it can lead you down a, a wrong path. Right. And it can be very tough. So in the late 1800s, there was a, uh, a, a man that had left his wife and baby and uh, uh, somewhere in California and went further and bought some land and was preparing a place for them to come and dwell and enjoy their life. And so he notified her that he was ready for them to come, sent her a ticket for a, a train ride. And so she packed everything up, got her baby and got on the board and was taken off. And the conductor came to her and everybody else getting a ticket. And she said, how will I know when to get off? Where my stop is? And he said, well, don't worry. I will come and tell you. I'm sorry. I'm not looking over here. I need to rotate. <laughs> I'll tell you when to get off. And she said, okay. So she was resting. And she was comfortable with that. So they're going along for several hours. And all of a sudden, the train comes to a stop. It's really snowy outside and cold outside. And, and uh, the lady was wondering if it was her stop. And this man behind her could see that she was concerned. And she said, he said, well, ma'am, he said, the conductor's probably really busy. This is your stop. So I will help you and your, your baby off. And so she said, good. So he helps her off. She puts her coat on, wraps her baby off, and gets off. And the man sits down. He's all proud about what he's done. He was able to help her, if you would, a messenger to her. And so an hour later, the train comes to a stop again. And the, the conductor comes back and, and says, where's the lady and the baby? He said, oh, I knew you were busy and I told her to get off and I helped her off. And this horrid look came over him. He said, that was not the stop. That was where we got more water and more coal. And so he rushed to the uh, engineer and said, we need to back up. And they backed up for an hour and got back there and got off and they had frozen to death. That's not a true story. <laughs> but that's what happens when you can go to all the wrong places looking for love. You can go to all the wrong places looking for a comforter messenger. That's not really a comforter messenger. Some people just want to help. And I've seen that in my ministry. I've had ministry where we had a church and we had a some people there and what I'm preaching, they're taking them up to a room somewhere else. And they're giving them, I can help you because he's busy. I'm not saying they said that, but it's kind of that mindset. He's busy and I can help you. And I found out years later, this is one couple was starting their own church doing that in our church. And that happens all over the place. And so it's important for you to understand if you're going to have spiritual growth, make sure that you're there you're like brother garner said when somebody wants to feed you something make sure you know what they got in their hand exactly. you know what what they what are they what what hole are they trying to drag you down to maybe or whatever so uh the moral of the story is don't let any well-meaning teacher instruct you in dead works of righteousness i'm not saying don't go to other teachers there's other teachers I know, but don't let them instruct you in dead works of righteousness because it'll lead you down that wrong path and you might, in, might end up freezing to death. <laughs> you might end up cut off from the knowledge of God and, and, and that's not good. And that's what was happening with the people in Rome and Jerusalem and the surrounding area. They were still trying to come to them and say, well, we can teach you, you know. In fact, there was one group that said, well, it's all right if you teach them these things, but please let's, let us keep circumcising them. Can we at least keep that law? Well, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Okay, uh, Romans 10.3. Since they have not seen or been aware of Father's true character and nature, nor have they seen and been aware of their true character and nature as Father's perfect image, they sought to gain it according to their merit and works. They failed to listen intelligently. Remember what I told you about what the word obey means? It's, it's literally, well, it's the wrong word. It's, it came from Shama. It means to listen attentively or listen intelligently. So they weren't listening attentively or intelligently. And they did not pay heed to Father, what Father said to the messengers. So they ignored the decree, which was made in the beginning when the declaration that Father created all people 
and the perfect resemblance, likeness, character, nature his father was made. Therefore, they sought validation through material gain. Now, I think Paul's talking more about the leaders than he is the individual people. Because how can they ignore something they were never taught? <clears throat> right? <clears throat> so, I don't blame my pastors either. I blame the beginnings of all this. The, the, all, all the way back to the Mosaic Law and then the people that begin to embrace the Mosaic Law and continue to teach it and then come up with, no, with penal substitution. It's the system that did it. They ignored the love of God. Why would they do that? Because they didn't want to let God's people go. Mm. All right? And that story is in Pharaoh. Father over and over and over told Moses, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And I've been saying this for several years. Father is saying through messengers today, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. I can't tell you how many ministers I've spoken to and told them, You need to let your people go because they'll make responses to me. Well, I would love to have you in. And what you're saying sounds really good. And this was even back in penal substitution. But my people are immature and they can't take this. And I always said, wait a minute, they're not your people. And first of all, I can tell you this. If you will tell them that you have learned that there's a greater truth than what we've been studying for the last hundred years, your people are ready for it because they, these, these perceived truths are not helping them whatsoever. Yeah. They're no different than, quote, sinners. They're no different than people that are not in church. Church people have the same problems as the unchurched people do. Amen? Yes. It's the truth. Amen. I hadn't said amen a long time. <laughs> so this verse here suggests that due to this lack of awareness, people tend to seek validation and fulfillment through worldly means and external validation because they can't get it from Father because they don't know Father. And they can't get it from their religious teachers but they because they don't validate them. They still keep them in a condemned situation so they can do what, Ali? Control, right? Mm -hmm. So they can control them. So they believe they must earn their worthiness and merit through external accomplishments. And it can be in the world, it can be in the church or whatever. And they feel validated for that. So the failure to listen intelligently uh, is a critical factor in disconnection. If you don't you know, if you don't spend time with me, we don't talk, we don't do anything, there's a disconnection. And when we see each other again, we're just kind of, hey, it's good to see you. You know, there's no connection whatsoever. So connection is very important. And so our past generations have been distracted by all kinds of stuff, noisiness, busyness, external influences, neglecting the inner voice, not even know that God's speaking to you. Yeah. Remember I told you for years, Donna always said, God said this, God said that, and I would get upset because I'm a pastor, and I never heard God. <laughs> I didn't think I did, but I was busy. I was busy on my job. I was busy doing the work of the church. I was busy with gospel hootenanny, setting up sound systems. You know, I wasn't really into what That's Donna true. did. Gospel hootenanny. <laughs> we, we, I heard of that. <laughs> huh? I love it. <laughs> you love it? We, uh, when I was 16, uh, I was praying, and the Lord put it on my heart for me and my brother and my best friend to go out in shopping centers and sing. So we set up my drums, a guitar, and then my brother would preach. And then it grew into this massive ministry with an 85 voice choir, two quartets, and all over Oklahoma City. It was, I'll show you the album someday. I've got an album where I'll let you listen to me sing. <laughs> if you want a good laugh. <laughs> I, was, I was the bass singer. <laughs> <laughs> so so because of because of a lack of knowledge of our leaders and because of lack of willingness to study to show ourselves approved because that's what Paul told uh, Timothy Timothy was like 14 years old he was the pastor of a church the, the church and he basically he hired people that were qualified by the world and it was falling apart and Paul told him this time, get faithful people. But then he said, a workman will study themselves to show themselves that they are approved of God. Now, the church will tell you that says they will study so God will be approved of you. So you need to come to Bible study. You know, but that's not what that says. And so because of that lack there, then that that establishment of, of, of uh, understanding who we are and that we're the likeness and char character of father, it, it, it dimmed. So in light of all this understanding, 
our generation. That's where we're here. It doesn't matter to us a lot about the past generation or the future generation. We just live in the now. The future will take care of itself. But our generation is being called to awaken to truth. And I've, I haven't used this for a long time ago, a uh, long time, but the DNA, divine nature, I, I like to say we have a divine nature activity because that's the same thing as the Logos. It's the creative spiritual activity, right? And so to me, what happened is when man decided to learn from their own experience, that divine nature activity degenerated in their awareness. It was still there, but they didn't live out of that activity. They didn't live out of the life of God. They weren't plugged in in their awareness to their source anymore. And so Paul invited the people of his day and for us to move beyond our reliance on this external validation. And this invitation is, is a deeper awareness. It's, it's a listening more. And that's why I'm gearing towards meditation here. We're going to talk about that more. But there's this, this listening, when you listen, when you quiet yourself and you calm yourself down, then you begin to hear the whispers of the voice. And because the voice isn't loud, the voice isn't mean. Contrary to the Ten Commandment movie, it's not, thus saith the Lord, you know, and riveting your whole entire being. It's a calm, <coughs> quiet voice, and it does sound like your voice. It sounds like you, but you know it's Father. Yeah. Do you know it's Father? Because sometimes, you know, this doesn't, didn't come from my awareness. This, this is not something I made up. I mean, some things I hear in there and I type out, I call Butch and Kathy, I mean, Butch and uh, uh, Kay, and I'll say, does this sound right? <laughs> you know, because sometimes, sometimes it's a new thing to me. And I'm, I'm glad I have them because we, we all need somebody that we can kind of be responsible with, that we can accountable. be accountable to. And they've never told me I'm wrong, so <laughs> it must be from God. <laughs> so uh, we want to be established in this, uh, all the way to our very interior of our being, that this journey that we're embarking on, it's a true discovery of ourself and it's a true discovery of Father. And I like what Mallory's doing because I believe that's what you're doing with these ladies that come to you. You're causing them to discover who they really are. And uh, it's sad how people can't look at their mirror and love themselves and they hide themselves and they don't want to be seen and they don't want pictures of them out there and they don't know who they are. So meditation, is an excellent tool to use during this journey. And being quiet, being calm, listening to the voice of Father, allow Spirit to speak to you and you speak to Spirit. And I like it, I'm saying it a lot lately, I say, Spirit, I'm one with you. And Spirit, I give myself to you, I give my thoughts to you, I give, I give this physical body to me because I know I am you, slow down the visibility. And then basically I just give spirit all authority into my life. That's what I'm practicing right now. And when you do that, it brings forth this remarkable state of, I like this word blissfulness, where you just, you, you don't have worries, you don't have fears, or if you do, they don't dominate you. It would be foolish of me to say, none of you ever have a fear or a worry, but we know what to, we know what to do with it. And we, we, we give it to spirit. And I say, this is not a thought that lines up with you, spirit. Or if you want to say God, or if you want to say Father or Papa. So we reach this point where there is a necessity for greater spirituality. And our meditations reveal to us uh, the way through redeeming our methods of thought and redeeming our method, method, methods of life. Because we have methods of thought, and I'm going to talk to you about a little bit, that need help. Because the way a person thinks mm -hmm. is their realization. Mm -hmm. So our thinking and our energy must be in tune with our walk. And the Bible says that the first race of man, Adam, walked in the cool of the day. They walked with Father in the cool of the day. Well, it wasn't spring and there was cool air. There, it wasn't winter. You look it up and it's Ruach, as I've said before, uh, R-U-W-A-C-H. And it literally means spirit or breath. So literally... They walked as spirit, not in spirit, but they walked as spirit. And then something happened some way or another. 
Some people begin to digress from that, and then they became teachers, and they taught the knowledge of good and Bible, uh, good and bad, and then they digress, and they left that realm of spirit in their awareness. But they were still there. When God said, where are you? He didn't, it wasn't like they, they, they were lost. He was saying, where are you in your awareness? What's happened to your conscious awareness? What's happened to your spiritual awareness of you and me as one? So how often during your day are you aware of spirit? So your eight hours that you work or your 10, how often are you aware of spirit? You have a spiritual resource and it's available to you. And if embraced, it ensures you of life of joy, perfection, peace, and yes, bliss. And you can be in the midst of storm of a storm and not let it bother you. And Jesus was, as Mallory said, he was the greatest example to us. He always walked in spirit. The only time that he willingly left that understanding was when he had to settle those two questions. Am I who God says I am? am and am I supposed to take over the world or am I supposed to let the, the Jews kill me to reveal a lie? And he settled those two questions. It says he entered back into spirit. Well, how did he leave spirit? His awareness, he allowed his awareness to leave spirit and to be tested in that as we would be, if you would, or as man was in their awareness. And when, it, when he entered back in spirit, he said he, he hungered and he entered back in spirit. And then it said the fame of him was heard all throughout the land. And that's beginning, he began to walk among people and he wanted to teach them, but they were so bankrupt, they were so sick, they were so broke, they were so beaten down by the Roman Empire and by the religious system that he had to help them with their temporal needs. Because until you can sometimes help them with their temporal needs, you can't help them with their spiritual needs. Right? I feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I am spirit. <laughs> Say it real loud, not I fast. I meant to be reminded because this was on my heart this week is that when you're saying be aware of your spirit on a day to day, it's not you have to do something. Right. It's not saying like how many times do you sit and right. pray. It's not a do. It's not on your to do list. Right. Just remember right. that it's always a part of you. Be aware of it. Right. You know, just remind people that's old religious thought and right. process is that you have to do something or else now I feel shame or guilt. That I didn't pray enough. You're just saying, remember, be aware that it's in you. It's in your breath right. to tap into throughout your day. All right. You got ahead of my sermon. You know oh, what I'm going to say here. <laughs> That's okay. That's it's good because it's just knowing your spirit. When you know your spirit, nothing, nothing can come nigh your dwelling place, right? And that's why if 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 you don't know your spirit, then opposition can come to you. And it can move you and it can shake you to your very core. So it's just a knowing who you are. And so you, you, you walk about through this life and sometimes there's tragedies, sometimes there's good things, sometimes there's bad things. And the good doesn't bother you and the bad doesn't bother you. What I mean by bothering, it doesn't puff you up, if you would. So no matter where you are or what you're doing, you, sh you should and you can experience yourself as spirit, as love. And you have the, again, you have the spiritual resource that's available to you. And in your notes, Allie, I thought you would love this word. It looked pretty cool to me. There's a, our name. There's a city in Syria named Seraphim. Sepharaphim. That's how it's pronounced. S-E-P-H-A-R-V-A-I-M. And it means dual meditations. It means two inscriptions. It means two letters, it means two books, and it means two scribes. What would, make, what would that make you think about? The Double realm of minded. what? Opposites. Uh -huh. Dualism. You have one scribe that writes one thing, the other scribe that writes another right. thing. You have, you have uh, uh, inscriptions, which they in, inscribed on stone, if you would. And so there's two different, you have dual meditations. Now, what does that mean? Well, you're going along during the day, and you begin to meditate, you're, you're kind of meditating on the Lord. You're thinking about life while you're doing your work. I mean, you can do, you don't have to go sit down somewhere. You just do it while you're studying and, and, and you're working or you're writing or whatever. But then another meditation can kick in when somebody comes up and says something mean to you or your boss dumps all here, dumps a whole bunch more work on you. And then there's another thought that can come to you. But when you, 
when you spend more time meditating on spiritual things, then those things don't bother you. You just say, thank you. <laughs> I'm preaching to you, baby. No, I'm not. But those things are hard to do, but you do it more and more and more, you know, and then it becomes easier and easier and easier. Yes. It's just like lifting weights. I've never been a weightlifter, but I know that if I'm going to lift weights, I need to start with one pound. <laughs> Today, I can barely lift five, you know, but you, you start a little bit at a time and you, you lift those weights and you lift those weights. But if somebody comes up, like Stephen yes. comes up and puts a 200 pound weight on me, what am I going to do? I'm going to get all mad and get upset. Why did you do that? Why did, but if I've been lifting and exercising it and, and my muscles are building up and then he comes and says, okay, let's go to 200 pounds, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Right? So the same thing. Uh, there's sometimes you have to start with little things and you, you realize this is not going to affect me. This, there's no weapon formed against me can prosper. And you start in little things. And next thing you know, you get to the place when, you're, when your boss drops a file this big on your desk. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just using stupid examples. I'm sorry. Yes, that's good. That's real. Thank you. That happens. So these all speak of dualism are opposites. And in Father, there is no realm of opposite. In spirit, there is no realm of good, bad, sick, poor, whatever, uh, or sick will. And so when one has a dual state of conscience, they experience partly good and partly bad in our thoughts. And we, we're all there somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. Partly good, partly bad. And the dual habit of thinking results from reasoning according to the senses are the outer appearances. And we always want to go within, always go within. So Sirius signifies the thoughts of an intellectual realm that do not understand the inner man of the heart, the hidden man. The Bible calls it the hidden man of the heart. There's another place where it says, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Well, that's talking, talking about greater is the divine mind that's in you than your awareness of the material, your awareness of the world. And, and, and spirit is greater than anything that can come against us. So... Divine mind, divine conscious, divine awareness, Father, Spirit, Papa, whatever. I like to say divine nature activity. That is the creative spiritual activity that reveals the law of spirit of abundant life. And if you're not plugged into that, then you're really not understanding that you have abundant life. Amen. And you can live out of that and you can walk and tread about your life out of the cool of the day, moment by moment by moment. Then that verse that says nothing formed against you can prosper. That's when that takes place. It's not me just saying it. Saying it's not going to do tiddly squat. Ali said to be some of the words I need, I, I need to change some of them, sound more like me, so I'm going to say tiddly squat. <laughs> so the inner man, what is the inner man? It's spirit. And what, be, what becomes inner man is your, your inner awareness or your heart awareness. When the two become one, then that's when you're flowing in that and it's easy. And you cease learning from people who, who's, all their knowledge comes from senses. It comes from the world's intellect. And, 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 and even Isaiah said, cease from that. And then he said, for wherein is he to be counted of? In other words, they're not worth listening to. And I had, I've had to do that a lot for quite a while. People will say, hey, you need to read this book. You need to listen to this guy or whatever. And for a while, I would go and I would just hear penal substitution. I would hear devil, demon. And I thought, you don't know what I'm preaching. You tell me he's teaching what I'm teaching. So I basically, I don't, I don't listen to him anymore. And I appreciate people telling me I should listen, read him or whatever. But if it's somebody I trust, somebody I know that's been following me or somebody that's another teacher, yes. You know, Donna was given a book. Uh, we were given a book the other day. Do you remember the title of it? Right what is it? It's Catherine Toon. Name names it's Catherine Toon. That's okay. She doesn't care. Marked by Love. Uh, Marked by Love. It's a really good book. And I trust that lady. And so I read her books. But I'm not going to read everything that comes down the pike. So we, we it's often not exactly struggle. What you teach, but huh? It's not exactly. Well, I know it's not exactly what I preach, but it's really filled with a lot of teaching about love. Uh-oh. Messed up that video. <laughs> so we too often struggle with dual med meditation, right? We, 
One moment our thoughts meditate on the material, the next moment we meditate on that which is spiritual. And again, in the next moment we meditate on the opposites and we meditate on what we experience. What I mean by meditate is we just think about it, right? I, I think I tell you, I've had many times I work or at church, it's happened a lot, where a pastor would say something not very nice or a board member or somebody else, and I come home and I, I meditate. I don't go in there, and, but I think about it, and it just, it just gets inside of me, and it makes me sick, and sometimes it gives me diarrhea. Sometimes it makes me depressed. Sometimes I can't sleep, right? You ever been there where you toss all night long and all your dinners, where you're meditating? So we have to choose what we're going to meditate on. And the more we meditate on spirit, two or three hundred pound opposition come against me won't bother me. Yeah, man. Right? Yeah, man. So we can make our daily meditations conform to spirit. We can make what we think about conform to theory. We, spirit. We can realize this is not spirit. Yes. What was said to me is not spirit. What was said to me is from a carnal awareness. The, the reason they talk to me about this is because they don't know who they are right. and they don't know who I am. I'm not going to hold it against them. Yeah. When Jesus, Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was talking to those soldiers because they were devastated. They really realized that he was a son of God. They, they knew who he was and they were grieving and they were hurting. And Father said, don't hold this. Don't let them have this shame. Don't let them feel this guilt. That's what was being said right then. So we don't have to go through some of that stuff. We are not servitude to the voice of our thoughts. We control our thoughts. We yield our thoughts to spirit. I've been in that place where I was servitude from, to carnal thoughts and servitude for what people said about me. And I was always trying to please people. I was always trying to please, please my pastor for many, many years. And there was nothing I could do to please, nothing whatsoever. So does it take practice? Yeah. It takes practice. It does. And that's why the Apostle Paul explained that logic and artful intuitiveness, which is our right brain, uh, left brain, they come together. They, they merge together. And we, we can uh, have logic, but it needs to be controlled by spirit, not intellect. Mm -hmm. And so Philippians 2.5, Paul encourages us to exercise our divine mind. How do you exercise your divine mind? You use it. Yes. That's it. How do I exercise my muscles? I use them. I lift and I lift and I stretch and I do all those things. And I've looked at people before and said, man, I wish I looked like you. <laughs> well, are you going to the gym? No, but I sure wish it. <laughs> I wish I could play piano, but I really never took piano lessons like I should have. So we recognize the condition of our thoughts, our desires, our will under the control of the right brain, the divine mind. Then we live out of love. We live out of perfection. We live in peace. We have a calm, quiet life. And that doesn't mean we can't shout and holler and have fun and all that. But I'm talking about right inside here, we're calm. We're at peace no matter what goes on. If our thoughts, desires, and our will are only controlled by carnal awareness, then in a measure we experience chaos in our meditations. And again, think meditation is thought. Because that's how you meditate day day in and day out is your thoughts and so what does the bible says it says if paul said if there's anything worth thoughting on thinking on if there's anything i'll say if there's anything if there's anything worth putting in your thoughts put these things in your thought and what were those things they were what he taught they were, they were what he explained it's love peace and joy and kindness it's 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 the the, the words that father god spoke i mean that jesus tried to teach and Paul came along and explained. So I say this to you today, if there's anything worth putting in your thoughts, put these in your thoughts. I am who God says I am. And I am here to have dominion over this world first and then the world around me. So still, because we've allowed our left brain thinking to run rampant, we're not fully aware of the Logos the creative spiritual activity that re reveals the law of the spirit above in the life. <laughs> That's the hardest thing to memorize, isn't it? Every one of us, this is so true. I, 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 I wrote a, a, published one of my books on the garments of the high priest, and it's from the redemptive view, but it's still got a lot of stuff good in it. But every one of us is the high priest of our temple. We are in control of our, our temple. 
when, when we enter uh, our divine mind of being a son or a daughter of God, we sacrifice the personal, if you would, or the ego uh, uh, upon the altar to realize the Christ way of living, the Christ which is contact with Father. That's the way Jesus lived. And we, we, uh, there's a secret place of the Most High. And I've, I know I've talked to you a lot about outer court, holy place, most holy place. As, as I've said recently, outer court is a place of, of, where you quote, you got saved in your mindset. And you're working and you're trying to please God and you're trying to pay your tithe and you're always worried and you're always having to get saved over and over and over again. You're always having to repent. You're always asking to ask for forgiveness. All forgiveness means is faithful to drive it away from you. That's all that means. And so uh, we were taught that holy place was when you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what Brother Garner taught us. And we got the blue robe, you know. But literally, and I've just come to realize this in the last month or so, it's a place of intense learning. Literally, in our awareness, we're in the holy place. This holy place when embraced and received, wakes us up to the fact that we are already the most holy place. We are, I mean, I just feel goosebumps all over me, Father saying amen. But we, we got to get to where we realize we are the holy place. We are God walking in this earth visible to all people. And this world needs it bad. My friends need it. My neighbor needs it. Even some people that come in here sometime, they're still not fully awakened to who they are. And, and that's the greatest need that this earth has is that there will be a comforter messengers like Jesus that can walk among people and they'll say, wow, who was that? Not, not to puff you up, but who was that? I just spoke to an angel because that's what they call it, but it's a messenger. And so what did Jesus do? He did everything he did everything he saw his father do, and he said everything he heard his father say, and the only way he did that is he stayed in contact. That's exercising. That's exercising. How much do you think Jesus communed with father? I think he did it day and night. That's the proper answer. You can converse with father no matter what's going on around you. If someone's fighting with you, your thoughts can be on father. You can realize that that's them, that's not me. I'm not receiving the poison. Jesus sent his disciples out to go minister the truth to, to the communities. And he said, if they reject, reject you, in the King James, it says, wipe the dust off your feet. It means don't receive the poison. Because if it's in your thoughts, you receive the poison. If you're worried about it, you receive the poison. Yeah. If you discuss it over and over and over, it's okay to share things with, but share it with like-minded people. Share it with somebody who can remind you, Donna, that's them, that's not you. Pray for them. It's not you. It's their problem. The scripture says to meditate on the Logos day and night. And I add to it, the rest of the time, do what you want. <laughs> but literally, you can meditate 24 hours a day. Well, what about sleep? You can meditate in your sleep. And I'm constantly saying, Father, when I go to bed, some of these drugs are giving me some really wild dreams and I don't want them and I want to sleep. And I just keep saying, Father, I give you my thoughts. I want to meditate on you in my dreams. And quite often it happens. Sometimes I go to sleep and I don't dream anything. But then every once in a while I wake up and there's a dream that's bothering me and I just begin to speak to it. And I say, no weapon formed against me can prosper. And you are a, web a weapon formed against me, and I speak to you to leave. And then I begin to force myself to think on the goodness of the Lord. No mushroom soup for breakfast. No mushroom <laughs> soup for breakfast, that's good. I hope Angela sees that post. So, thoughts of duality can make you mad or they can make you glad. Yes. Right? They can make you angry or they can make you calm. And they can make you make wrong decisions, yes. right? And they can make you quit jobs. They can make you break up relationships. Uh, you name it, all kinds of stuff. And it's better to be at peace. And when you're at peace, you make good thoughts. And if you're trying to make a decision and you don't feel peace about it, don't do it. So what are your thoughts? 
when there's turmoil all around you. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, a lady, and she was all in distress and everything about the world and everything. And I said, I'm going to give you a word. <laughs> you know, I said, you've been listening to the news too much, haven't you? And she said, I watch it all day long. I said, so what you're doing is you're not thinking on spiritual things. You're thinking on carnal things and you're, you're receiving, you're willingly embracing that. And I told her, how do I know you're doing that? Because I used to do it. And it just wears you out. So are your thoughts calm? Are they quiet? Are they peaceful thoughts? Or are they filled with chaos? Because when there are thoughts that are not spiritual thoughts, they are chaos. You can't sleep. You can't, you can't function. You can't face certain people. All kinds of things happen. So our physical temples, which we see with our physical eyes, are magnificent. As conscious, our consciousness broadens, then we see the magnificence of them. As consciousness broadens, when I look at you, I see the magnificence of you. I see the beauty of you. I, I see through these physical eyes and my third eye my single eye opens up and I see through everything you present me at as and I see beauty last winter when it was really really cold I'm not bragging on what we do because lots of people do it but the temperature was supposed to drop way down and I had taken Donna to a doctor downtown Oklahoma City and we got off of I-40 and there was this what they call a tent city and it was just broke my heart and I thought they're going to be sleeping there tonight so Donna and I she agreed with me we came home and we had we have lots of clothes. If you look in our closet, you would it's particularly Donna's. <laughs> <laughs> but we had lots of coats, particularly me, because I I buy bargain stuff. I mean, I go to Walls and I'll find a hundred fifty dollar coat for twenty dollars. But we got every coat, but ten of mine, <laughs> and got some of Donna's. And and I took it there, and it it broke my heart. It it just. I looked at them and I saw that's somebody's son, that's somebody's husband, that's somebody's daughter, you know, and uh, it, it was tough. But we, that's how we got to see because if you don't see them that way, you can't love them, right? Yeah. You just walk on by. And so our physical temples, uh, we go deeper into the mysteries of our being. There's some, still some things we don't really know about ourselves or believe about ourselves, what we can do. We, we, we don't have to go walk on water to prove it, but if there was a necessity, we could. We don't have to go heal everybody in a rest home, but there is a, there is a necessity. I said heal. What'd you think I said, kill? No, heal. We don't have to do anything to prove it. But what I'm saying is we can do all things, and literally that word things is the logos. So we can do the word. We can do what the word says. We can understand the word. And spiritual thought and spiritual meditations are constantly carrying us to a place of, of ascension, uh, to form in us more like the divine idea that Father in our understanding. Because if I know who I am, then I will project who I am. And again, if I know who they are, then I will see them that way and I will pull that out of them. And again, that's what Mallory's doing, right? You're pulling it. It's already in them. So the truth is, God's not changing us. We are, uh, my worship leader, several years ago after I preached a sermon, she wrote a song called God's Not Changing Us. Changing me. He's waking me up to who I am. Yeah, Father's, Father's helping us remember. And literally, we should be thinking, we should literally be say, you know what? I've always thought this. And you know when you remember something, you kind of review it, you kind of see it. I remember going to the Grand Canyon, I see it. When we remember, we should see ourselves as we were created, as we were formed from the foundation of the world. We should, oh, this is who I am. Yes. I'm light, I'm energy, I'm spirit. So when, when Jesus came proclaiming the spirit of the Lord was in him, was with him, anointing him, he opened the single eye of people. He opened the single ear of people. And I believe more than we've seen in the Bible, I do believe he was able to teach to a lot of people. And their eye had to open because they wouldn't have received that healing that they needed. I mean, the, 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 the dude that had the withered hand and Jesus looked at him and saw a whole hand 
And he said, stretch your hand out. And it was whole. Well, he played part of that because Jesus always said, your faith has made you whole, mm -hmm. right? So he brought their faith energy level up. And sadly, everywhere Jesus went, the Pharisees were there like ravenous wolves. And they brought the people right back down. They closed their single eye. So we must follow Jesus in this eternal temple building. He, he lit out of his perfect body. And if we make these pro, uh, proper adjustments in our heart awareness, we enter into this per, uh, perfect oneness. We enter into this calmness and this peace. And we walk about in, in life. And literally, we honestly get to the place where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. You have to remind yourself all the time. Yes. It's looking bad out there. Oh, I and the Father are one. They may be wanting to take all of our money and give us cryptocurrency. I and the Father are one. Does cryptocurrency limit God? No. no. Not at all. Does having a bad government limit God? No. Does having a medical uh, uh, world that they're run by greedy people? No. None of that affects God. So why does it affect us? Yes. Right? Yes. It shouldn't affect us whatsoever. So what's the proper uh, understanding of meditation? And I'm closing here. Meditation is not simply a practice of relaxation and quieting your thoughts. It's a profound spiritual tool for connecting with Father, reminding us that we already are connected with Father. I don't have to get contact with Father. I have contact with Father, but I have to be aware that I have contact with Father. Recently, I've met uh, Mallory by way of Donna, and we contact each other, but Donna, I mean, so Allison, we, we have had some contact, but the way to get to know her more and more is for us to contact each other more. And by the way, I'm still open to you coming over weekly. It's up to you. I, I know you're busy. Okay, good. But we're going to get to know to each other where we're one. And uh, what I, my goal is, and I'm not saying I know more than she knows, because I know you know a lot. But my, my goal is, is where you can take what I'm putting in you and then you can go out and give it to your world. Yeah. But you have to have contact. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, we want to go out in the world and be father to the world. Yes. I don't want to be just a comforter messenger like look at Roy. I want them to see God because Jesus said, what did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Yeah. And that's where I want to be at. So we must have courage. We must have boldness we must enter into the absolute father the source of all things as jesus did and proclaim that without a shadow of a doubt and so meditation is seen as a practice that enables us to transcend seemingly limitations uh, we must never again let this phrase come out of the mouth i can't do that now you can you, you maybe you can't do something that I tell you to do, but the Bible says that you can do all things through contact with Father that strengthens you. So if Father speaks to you to do something, do it. If I tell you to do something, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe it's not right, but you can listen to Father. Father is not just going to fill you up with all this knowledge just for you. He's done it for your world. And some people say, well, I don't have anybody to minister to. Do you go to Walmart? Do you go to 7-Eleven? Do you, do you go shopping, whatever? Be willing to open your mouth and talk. Do you have a family? Do you have a family? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. Be willing and realize I may, be not be, I may not be here just to buy a dress. There may be a lady here that's been saying, God, help me. Please help me. I don't know what to do. And you can just... You, you don't, you could, the, the, if you're willing, the Lord draws that, that word out of you, yeah. that sentence that you say to that person that opens that up. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I've had so many experiences with people and I can't tell you what caused the conversation to take place. I, I didn't walk up and say, would you like to know more about the Bible? <laughs> you know, or can I tell you about God? Or what, but it, just something happens. Yeah. And we get to talking and ever, sometimes I say, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I'm a minister. I teach on Facebook. And next thing you know, what do you teach? Well, why would anybody ask what you teach? We're supposed to all teach the same thing, but the truth is we don't. So, huh? Far from it. Far from it. 
So through this process of being still and know, which means calm and quiet, and entering the state of inner tranquility, we tap into the infinite mind. Infinite means forever. This infinite wellspring, spring up a well within me. And it's a wellspring of wisdom. It's a wellspring of guidance within. In this state of meditation, we open ourselves to receive this inspiration. I mean, just I just call it goosebumps. It's just the Spirit of God. I've felt it five or six times today. I mean, I could stop and just cry, you know. And uh, we, we get this clarity, and then we get advice in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you hear it, and you know without a shadow of doubt, a doubt it's God. And sometimes God can use a car tag. Did, did we tell you what happened with Allie? She, she wanted to spend a certain amount of money. You can say how much. Okay, $777 to bring a person in from California that ministers the way she loves. Is it California? Nashville. Oh, Nashville. And it's a lot of money. It's not that she can't afford it, but it's a lot of money. So she was meditating and asking God if that's something she could do. She was also thinking, you know, that, you know, that money's not my source, blah, blah, blah. And so she gets in the car and she see all of a sudden this car pulls in front of her and it says AC what ACS 777 Allie can spend 777 dollars <laughs> <laughs> is she stretching it or was that god it was literally in the moment i know i, in the car, I love it and i look up and see it immediately so, so. i know it's powerful we can choose to look away or we can yeah. choose to take that i guarantee you god. There's, there's all kinds of ways that Father shows us and reaches us. <laughs> I, I have told lots of people about that, and I, I think it's awesome. So, again, we want to transcend limitations of what is wrongly seen at the, in the physical. This is important. We want to transcend what is wrongly seen with physical eyes. We all need that. Because we look at people in the streets sometimes and we judge them. We see things, we have people say things bad all the time and it upsets them. One thing that used to upset me all the time is I, I go probably two miles over the speed limit when I'm on a highway. And I try to do the speed limit as much as I do in the city and I try to obey the rules. And people drive behind me, honk, pass me and tell me I'm number one. <laughs> and that used to bother me so much. I used to just honk my horn at them and flash my lights at them. You know what? Now I don't care. I don't care. That's their problem. It's not mine. I'm not going to let it get my heart beating. And because when we do this, then we expand our consciousness. We expand our heart, uh, our, our heart awareness. And no finger sign can be formed against you, can prosper. It can't hurt you whatsoever. I just think, you don't know who I am. Why are you doing that to me? I don't, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm going 40-something. But see, that conversation should never come off my lips because they're having a bad day. They want to be out in front. I don't want to be out in front all the time anymore. Sometimes, but not always. So, my last paragraph. A spiritual understanding of meditation recognizes it is a profound spiritual practice that goes beyond the surface level of just relaxation and being quiet and sitting there. It's literally focus, focusing yourself on the divine mind. And I encourage you to meditate often. And it can be the way you do it yourselves. It can be getting off by yourself in the bedroom. It can be taking a walk. It can be studying or whatever. But quiet yourself and listen to Father. Make sure there's always a time of not talking. And try not to think the best you can and just listen. And I promise you, you'll hear because Father's always speaking. Amen? I hope you enjoyed this today. It's good for us. Amen. So we love all of you. Hi, Connie. Good to see you're here today. Uh, again, if you're interested in joining our Ecclesia group and you are questioning your theology, and we're not looking for people that want to debate Scripture and why I believe this or why I believe that, but I've had many, many years of study, and I can answer a lot of questions. And so all you have to do is reach out to me, message me, and I'll explain that to you. If you're friends with Allison Parker, Allie, uh, Allie Noel on Facebook, right? Uh, you can message her and she can help you with that. Or Mallory, either way, we would love to have you with us. So thank you very much. Glenda, it's good to see you here too. Bless you. Love you all. Bye-bye.